edition of Black Focus. I'm your host, Ron Edwards, coming to you from the corporate studios of MTN. Beautiful day today, much better than it was yesterday, but then the day before that was a very nice day. And so, what the heck, appreciate what it is we have. It could warm up a couple more degrees. Temperature's supposed to be in the low to mid 70s tomorrow. I don't think in this part of Minnesota we'll have any more snow. And it's going to be interesting how much rain we have this summer. This, the pattern, if you will, that, that we've seen emerging would indicate that we may be about due to be looking at uh, uh, drought, if you will. Not a lot of rain in the sector. Let's hope not. But it's quite clear that the environment is out of balance. No doubt about that, you know. So the experts will pontificate, argue, enunciate, you know, talk in terms, craft, craft, are their ideas and their philosophies. The citizens, if you will, are just happy that, you know, they can come out of their coats and et cetera. A lot of people out here with their shorts and everything on and et cetera. So want to wish them the best. A lot going on uh, across the world here in the United States. Uh, we will touch on the Mohammed Noor trial. Uh, we were having a chit chat here in studio <coughs> with our executive director and, and others. Um, the reporter that MTN has covering the uh, Mohammed Noor trial is indicating that this situation, uh, this trial, uh, could come to a conclusion pretty quick. Our our timeline is by the end of next week, uh, they could begin final arguments, if you will. I just don't see, uh, unless Nor's attorneys make the mistake of putting him on the stand, which I don't think Nor will go for that, as he should not go for it, as we've said uh, for two years. Um, his lawyers initially uh, created uh, the best possible platform for him by having him give no statements so that uh, the information uh, that he gave that night, 15 July uh, 2017, would not be quote unquote twisted in such a way as to challenge uh, his integrity and et cetera. So we think that next week when we begin this program that we'll be saying that it appears that the wrap-up is about three days away. Again, we'll, we'll be broadcasting on a Tuesday and that uh, the wrap-up uh, certainly, as we said, would be about three days away. I, I just don't see who it is that the defense can bring in that would make any kind of difference. And again, our, our reporter on the spot is indicating uh, that Nor very well uh, could be acquitted, if you will. Now, we concur with that based on what we're seeing. Big article in this morning's edition of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Um, there is clearly a war going on uh, between the Minneapolis Police Department and the county attorney's office. It, it goes way back. It goes back to when Mike Freeman got drunk at a Christmas party and uh, was bad-mouthing the BCA and et cetera and the Minneapolis Police Department. And then he, if you remember, took it out on the MPD by calling over 50 police officers to testify before a grand jury. He didn't call that many the second time he called the grand jury, which, by the way, the fourth estate, the media in this town, clearly stays away from the real narrative, if you will. They talk in terms of timeline, but every time they give you the timeline, they seem to forget uh, that second, uh, actually third charge against Mohammed Nord of second degree murder, if you will. That, that was covered in a lot of politics, if you will. And last week, after our, our program of last Tuesday, the quote-unquote bicyclists, uh, who turned out to be, at the time of the incident, 16 years old, now 17, or maybe moving up to 18, I'm, I'm not sure when his birthday was, uh, 
came in with some interesting information, something we touched on on these programs three weeks ago as of this program, and so we will take a look at that. We will come back to the more to the more to the North situation, if you will, some of the insight that is is going on and uh, other kinds of actions. Uh, by the way, we exclusively reported uh, last Tuesday a meeting that was taking place that kind of blew the lid off of relationships, not be involving the NPD, but uh, some of our council members, if you will, particularly Cunningham our, uh, and our, uh, individuals uh, who were involved with white nonprofits in North Minneapolis who were doing everything they could to undermine um, the appointment, the selection of Nadir Arredondo as chief of the department. It, it's, it's an interesting situation. We will touch on it uh, as we move into uh, the first 20 minutes of, of this afternoon's program. Again, we're coming to you from the heart of information and news, if you will, uh, the Minneapolis Television Network, MTN. You know, it's, 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 it's proud, I'm proud to be affiliated with an organization that doesn't try to suppress <laughs> and keep a lid on the facts and the truth, if you will. These are difficult times. Let us take this occasion to send our, as we did in the situation in New Zealand, uh, our, our uh, prayers, if you will, and certainly are, are hoping uh, for a stabilizing of the situation in Sierra Walker. It, it, the, the bombings there yesterday uh, raised serious questions with regards to a worldwide terrorist organization or base that is much more dangerous than I think folks want to admit to, if you will, particularly the high-powered intelligence agencies in the rich and high-powered countries that can afford to have the very best for their intelligence agencies. I mean, that starts with the United States and Britain and France and uh, Sweden has an excellent uh, intelligence uh, system, if you will, Switzerland, if you will, uh, to a lesser degree, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, the low countries, that's Belgium and, and the Netherlands, you know, fairly, fairly good, but everybody is basically always dependent upon Big Brother. Consequently, we brought from our private library uh, the report entitled 9-11, and this is over a decade old now, but I don't think it will ever lose its importance, the book 9-11, but let's just bring it out a little bit. This was the 9-11 commission report after the tragedy uh, that befell uh, New York City and the, the Twin Towers and led to, well, actually we're still fighting that war, aren't we, with, with the Muslim world, if you will. Uh, what it says, final report of the National Commission on Terrorism, terrorist attacks upon the United States and et cetera. Well, a whole lot of countries are seeing Sri Lanka, if you will, a, a beautiful uh, island, if you will, uh, nation, maybe almost a continent. Uh, just off of the eastern shores of India. Uh, the target um, on, on uh, Easter Sunday of a terrorist attack, a series of terrorist attacks. What were, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven sites uh, were hit. Uh, it was the churches, I think, Christian churches, uh, in which over 300 people, if not more, were blown to pieces, if you will. Uh, then there were at least three attacks on uh, top of the line, or as we like to call them, four or five star hotels. Terrible situation, but what was scary, and the reason we brought the, the book, uh, the 9-11 Commission Report, is that in this book, and also a book entitled Prelude to Terror, which we will bring and put on the stand 
next, uh, next Tuesday. There were publications that clearly indicated after 9-11 that this was going to be a pattern and practice, P and P, if you will, uh, in the future of this world. Now, you know, it's been a long time since 9-11. We all know that, if you will. It's been a long time since some of the other tragedies. But then I can remember back when the African-American community was being bombed, you know, and African-Americans were dying and et cetera, and those were acts of terror. And I remember how difficult it was for this country and, and politicians, both Democrat and Republican, uh, to identify terrorism. In fact, people tried to pretend that they didn't know what terrorism was, but I take you back into the 1930s, if you will, when newspapers, for example, here in the Twin Cities were blasting, not the Germans so much, but the little yellow, Japanese for carrying out uh, terrorist acts in Asia, uh, particularly Manchu, as it was called, Manchuria, if you will, China, and et cetera. And I, I can remember just how easy it was for people to embrace terrorism. But then, as we moved into the 1960s, black churches started being blown up, black civil rights leaders and, and some of their white supporters being assassinated, shot and killed, and et cetera, that the word terrorist and terrorism and et cetera, you know, every effort was made to make it kind of disappear. And yet since the 1950s, really, <laughs> terrorism has been uh, in grained, if you will, in the very fiber of the United States of America. It's the reason that the caption here on, on the book, the 9-11 report, does not impress me as something that was a, a, an original reflection and thinking by members of the commission, the United States government, et cetera. You know, in black America, we had been seeing and our native red brothers and sisters had been seeing all kinds of acts of terror. You know, Don't you think and believe that all of those quote unquote massacres of Native Americans in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 1870s, 1880s, uh, actually all the way up to the, almost the 1890s, don't you think those Native American villages and et cetera, those Native American people being killed and wiped out, don't, you know, don't you think that they did not feel that there were acts of terror going on against them and et cetera? You know, I can still remember when people finally admitted that the art, I'll do it like that, that the art of scalping was not something that the savage red man came up with. It was done by quote unquote Europeans who had immigrated and migrated here to the United States of America, if you will anyone that wants to contest what we just said, go get, you, go get your history books, if you will. Scalping, yes, a, a very medieval kind of thing because actually um, the Huns and um, the Northmen and all those people way back in the 8th, 9th, 10th century and et cetera were you know, not only cutting people's heads off but were scalping them and et cetera. It's all a part of some medieval rituals that were taking place. So we say all that to say that what happened in Sri Lanka um, is, is not a surprise that this worldwide commitment to terrorism is fully blossoming, if you will. It has blossomed and it is tragic. Like I said, people in a religious institution, at church, if you will, um, enjoying a, a Christian holiday, that being Easter and, and et cetera, and are just blown apart. I was looking at a picture earlier this morning of one of the bombers who actually, the uh, video followed him right into the church. The last scene that you saw was him coming in the door as people were sitting in the pews and et cetera, Christian church, and he detonated his bomb. He was carrying a big, backpack uh, on his back, which should have said something to somebody. But Sri Lanka has, has been a place that for 20 years had a terrible civil war, Talma Tigers, 
and there was so much pain and, and uh, death and et cetera that since that conflict allegedly ended in, what was it, 2009, that Sri Lanka had been attempting to put itself back together again. With this attack, I'm not sure that we will not begin to see another round of, of terror and martial law uh, on that quote unquote island nation, if you will. But it also is a signal that irrespective of what the American president Donald Trump said about, you know, the Talithot and Talithate and Talith whatever uh, had been destroyed, the conflict had ended, and America's troops could come home and et cetera, you know. He needs those ground troops here to quote, help him build the wall and serve as a military buffer. See, people don't like to talk about that either because allegedly, not since, well, really, maybe a couple of strikes or et cetera in the 1900s, but not really since the Civil War has America's armed forces been used on American soil against American citizens, if you will. And that was kind of the history of the of what that conflict was all about. And we, the sons and daughters of the African, we certainly understand, remember, and et cetera, because if there was anyone that was victimized by that conflict, the Civil War of 1860 to 1865, it was black Americans. Now, long before that, though, our Native American brothers and sisters uh, were being victimized, if you will. You know, I keep hearing this statement being made that uh, the conflict in the Middle East, or in particularly in Afghanistan, um, and uh, e even Iraq, which continues to have conflict, but that this is the longest fought American war. And that is one of the dumbest statements that I've ever heard, because the longest war that the United States of America was involved in, and even before it became a republic independent of, of both the British, the French, the Spanish, <laughs> if you will. Uh, people tend to forget the role of Spain, controlling the western coast of the United States for a period of time, certainly controlling large swaths of, of land in what we now call the mid Midwest and, and et cetera. So we tend to forget the battles that America has fought, if you will, and uh, against uh, people of color. And the longest conflict uh, that this nation and its European settlers have been involved in is the war against the Native American, the indigenous people of this continent, if you will as well as the continent of Central America and South America. And even what is left of the culture and the civilization of the native people of the islands of the Caribbean and et cetera. I mean, we, 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 people get so into themselves with regards to how uh, profound and, and, and deep they are in understanding the history of this hemisphere that I don't know that they understand that they wind up practicing and advancing racism, if you will, because we have never talked about the acts of genocide against the indigenous people that we refer to as the Native American and, and et cetera. We really don't talk about it, but then we are in a decline right now as I speak in these studios as it pertains to the history of the African-American. <laughs> you know, we've been here for close to 500 years, if you will. Native Americans were here for a couple million. Now keep that in mind. But we, we, we tend to go to great lengths as a nation based on race to purge the history of all others except that of the European. And that's really not healthy, not good. It's the kind of thing that keeps us divided as a nation, a nation who basically the creators, if you will, the so-called founding fathers 
um, who all look the same, if you will, all European, what they crafted, articulated, wrote in different documents like the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and et cetera, had expectations of, but they never had expectations that it would be a society, quote unquote, of many colors, if you will. And it's just then too difficult. Now, I've said all that to lead us back to the Nor trial, if you will, that um, there had been great expectations. I, I was reading uh, the website of a well-known conservative who has been following the trial. He is kind of the sweetheart of the darling of the uh, conservative right, extreme right, who actually, in his last couple of postings, and I know there are many of you out there right now as we speak, who uh, go to his website, access his website, and the website of other uh, right-wing uh, bloggers and et cetera, who are beginning to say that they are concerned. Uh, joining, actually, uh, our on-the-ground reporter here from MTN, that it looks like the prosecution is letting any uh, opportunity uh, to convict Mohammed Nord began to slip away from them for any number of reasons, which we all know that at the conclusion of this trial, there will be much cavalier discussion and reflection and analysis and, and et cetera. And also, um, there will be, depending on who wins, who loses, a lot of finger pointing, if you will. Of course, the high stakes that are at play at this particular point uh, are with the, the uh, government, if you will, with the authorities, uh, with the county attorney, the state of Minnesota, and et cetera, because of their insistence, even a year ago, that this was a slam dunk, that there would be no problem, that they had irrefutable evidence, information, and et cetera, uh, to make an example out of Mohammed Nord and others like him. See, People work real hard to stay away from what they're really feeling and really thinking. That's why it is, it is refreshing to be here working with a media institution such as MTN because there are no restrictions placed on us about what it is that we can talk about, should talk about, but at the same time that we have a responsibility to be able uh, to support, defend, if you will, uh, our hypotheses, our theories, and, and et cetera. And that's, that's so refreshing. Now, one of the things that I'm aware of as I listen to my shortwave radios is that the Australian press is reporting a different flavor. Now, for those of you that are really into your computer and things like that, be advised that you may want to check periodically uh, particularly the three news entities that were uh, officially uh, uh, allowed into uh, the, the courtroom and had, you know, seats in press row and et cetera. Uh, and uh, Australian newspaper, Australian um, counter to CNN, if you will, and uh, uh, the uh, Australian uh, so-called uh, newspapers and, and etc., if you will. And so it is interesting how uh, particularly powerful, and it's the most powerful news media in, in, uh, in uh, Australia, and that is ABC, not to be confused with the American Broadcasting Corporation here in good old America, but uh, the uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, also called letters A, B, C. And it's interesting how they are reporting it, it, it during uh, the, the weeks of the trial, now in the fourth week, whatever that means. Uh, we have taken note of um, kind of a different flavor from the early morning, late evening, depending on the time of day, if you will, the uh, difference. Uh, between Australian time and, and uh, time here in the United States. It's interesting how they deal with their perception 
And now you're beginning to hear, particularly from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, very agitated, very agitated, and being a little critical now. See, no one is talking about that, but we here at MTN. The Australian media is now beginning to become critical of County Attorney Mike Freeman, beginning to raise questions about his competency, his integrity, his veracity, and et cetera. And I wondered how long it would take before that would happen. And so we have decided here at MTN that we will, we will take on the beast, if you will, and kind of take a look at the kinds of things that were being promised, which in fact, these promises were expected to be so firm and so consummated, if you will, that the family of Justine uh, filed a, using the attorney Bennett, filed a $50 million lawsuit against individuals and the city of Minneapolis, 50 million, okay? I said, oh, wow, okay. You remember that happened a number of months ago. No one really analyzed that because everyone pretended that they were concentrating and preparing for the trial and that the $50 million lawsuit against then uh, Chief Janae Harto, uh, of course, obviously, Mohammed Nord, uh, the city of Minneapolis, the Minneapolis City Council, the mayor at that time, Betsy Hodges, and et cetera, that that was going to be a slam dunk too, you know. I'm not sure that a jury, even in a situation in which the predator allegedly in the death of the beautiful blonde victim, that that person, the predator, was a person of color. And we know what the consequences are. See, we don't talk about that either. We're, we're very dishonest with ourselves as a society and a nation. We, we don't talk in terms of what we talk about, you know, over coffee at Starbucks, if you will, or, you know, at Murray's, if you will, or one of the other high price, high price places. We, we don't talk in terms of the kinds of observations that are made, and that's the reason that it's so hard to get fair trials in the United States when the issue is one of race, if you will. And so the Australian media who are covering this trial, and by the way, I mean, you know, a lot of money, you know, airfare, uh, already now a month and a half or more of accommodations and et cetera in the top hotels and et cetera, because, you know, they ain't, they ain't, you know, they ain't staying in no, you know, fifth rate <laughs> motel and et cetera. But they are now beginning to raise questions. And for those of you that are real, you know, um, individuals who, who spend a lot of time on your computers and et cetera, you like running that little mouse and et cetera, really need to pay more attention to how the Australian media is analyzing this because there has been a shift and I can appreciate why MTNs uh, on the ground reporter has begun to send information back to his boss that it looks like that Mohammed Nord is going to possibly walk, if you will, that the prosecution has not put together the kind of case um, that guarantees, quote unquote, a slam dunk, if you will. Now, in this corner, uh, for the last two years, we would indicate to you we're not surprised based on the many things that happened. Now, let's take a look at the bicyclists. We, we promised you at the top of the program that we would go back and take a look at some of the testimony last week. Now, the young bicyclist who first was identified on the evening of the 15th of July, the 16th and 17th of July, as an adult, if you will, everyone thought he was an adult. Everybody basically guessed that he was Caucasian, he was white, I'm, you know. Um, and so one always wondered, number one, why his identity was kept so secret in that everyone thought that he was an older person out riding his bike at, you know, one o'clock in the morning or thereabouts, if you will. Well, of course, it turned out that he was actually a 16-year-old. And this is not 
we hear at, at MTN slandering this young man in any shape, form, or fashion, mere, we're merely crafting and, and bundling and boxing what the media has reported. And that was that he was out that night at age 16, riding down the alley, if you will, uh, because he was taking, quote unquote, some drugs to a friend. In other words, he was a dealer, if you will, this 16-year-old individual. And that then leads us to what we talked about on these programs a week ago, when the Minneapolis Star Tribune, St. Paul Dispatch, the Australian media and others, New York Times and others, made this startling report that during the prosecution's case, and case in chief, as they called it, the prosecutor, one of the, of the two lead prosecutors, made a peculiar statement. We repeat that again here now at MTN. In the presence of the jury, while examining some police officer who was on the stand, and just kind of out of the blue, you know, normally a judge, a trial judge, requires veteran attorneys, legal practitioners, to be able to know how to craft uh, their approaches as it pertains to their evidence, to what we said just minutes ago, their, their case in chief, if you will. And the prosecutor said, just kind of out of the blue, it, it's there in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, St. Paul, Duluth newspapers, New York Times, all of the Australian media, that the young man, and now we were hearing that he was very, very, very young, on his bike that night, um, had seen Officer Knorr and Officer Heritage standing outside of their vehicle, and that Officer Nord shot Justine at point blank range outside of the vehicle. I mean, that, see, that was the ace in the hole that Mike Freeman and his prosecutors thought they had a year ago. I think about it now, my friends, a year ago, and a, 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 a year ago, that they had this bombshell, they had this golden witness, if you will, who was going to testify that that night, the 15th of July, 2017, that this, now we find out, I mean, at that time, that he was a teenager, if you will, but that he had seen Mohammed Nord, a black African, if you will, <laughs> a Somali, a police officer, former police officer, that this young man who, and it's very interesting because in it he has, you know, been certified as, as, a, as, a, as a teenager and not an adult. Technically, you're not supposed to publish his name. And if you notice, other than uh, the social media and et cetera, his name has never been published. But all of a sudden, the prosecutor says to the jury that this young man, was going to be a witness at trial. Now think about how we're, how we're crafting this for you, that he was going to be a witness at trial, but that upon further examination, and he used this key word, printed, reprinted by the Minneapolis Star Tribune and all of the publications on that particular day, uh, almost three weeks ago, that he was not reliable. All of a sudden he had become unreliable, if you will. Now I'm not sure that when Mike Freeman made the decision and, and utilized, if I'm not mistaken, utilized a grand jury for a second time, I'm quite sure that Mike Freeman did not tell the grand jury in round two, murder in the second degree, I'm pretty sure he didn't tell them that uh, there was a witness in which they were putting and betting so much on, who all of a sudden was getting ready to become unreliable. Now, this becomes crucial as we lay this narrative out, because after that statement, we hear, as an example, that MTN, you know, we, we're, you know, small entity, if you will. We don't even begin to have anything, including budget. <laughs> 
uh, that, that the big boys and girls have. But we sit here in these studios, you know, sitting in, in, in this studio, on this very couch, that we were, were kind of shocked because we, we have not been a critic of the judge. We think she's done a number of things to at least try to provide a fair trial, a fair atmosphere, and, and a fair result for Mohammed Nord, if you will, but that we were kind of shocked in that she, you know, she runs a pretty tight ship, that she did not inform the jury or instruct the proper Anglo-Saxon terminology would be to instruct the, even if there had been no objection, and I'm not sure based on the poor writing of the Minneapolis Star Tribune and some of the other papers, if the attorneys for Mohammed Noor objected to the statement by the prosecutor that a witness was going to initially testify that Mohammed Noor in cold blood, and here's the key elements of law, with malice and forethought, shot this 40-year-old woman as she stood there and think about it because he also gave a totally wrong description of how she was dressed, how she was attired. She was standing there with her house coat and pajamas and barefooted, if you will. And so the judge did not admonish the prosecution at that time. It's a key Anglo-Saxon word. And consequently, we don't know, we'll have to ask this of our reporter on the scene, if, if that reporter was, was in uh, the, the courtroom at the very moment that that statement was being made by the prosecutor. But the judge did not admonish the prosecutor and apparently never instructed the our, uh, jury to disregard the statement about, quote unquote, the honesty, the veracity, and et cetera, of this witness who the impression was would definitely, I mean, if I were a prosecutor, you know, and I'm telling a jury that we got this evidence, but, but we're not going to uh, place the individual on the stand because, and uses the word not reliable. See, the word not reliable under Anglo-Saxon law has a significant, significant meaning. I mean, you never take a witness knowingly who is unreliable and has already perjured themselves on the stand. But you also do not make statements that leave reasonable conflict, not doubt. And I didn't say doubt, I said conflict within the minds of the jurors because that's who you're trying to sell the bill of goods to those 12 individuals and four alternates, if you will, who are hearing this case. And so for a number of days, we heard nothing more about it. And then last week, suddenly, at the, we neared the end of the week, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, the Duluth Herald and, and others, and the, of course, the Australians, the Aussies, really not happy, uh, announced that the a uh, young man, now 17, was put on the stand. And you can judge for yourself, uh, for those of you, particularly for those of you who have websites and et cetera, how you as a juror would balance that this young man was even on the stand giving testimony under color of law. See, again, an Anglo-Saxon, even Norman term that is, is used and is in the big books, if you will, that govern, quote unquote, legal practitioners and et cetera, that he was put on the stand and he stumbled and fumbled and bumbled and, and et cetera. Um, the defense uh, actually almost, well, in many respects, beat the prosecution to the punch by requiring the young man to indicate just what he was doing out that night. Was he acting as a courier uh, in a drug deal, if you will? Um, what items of drug uh, paraphernalia and et cetera was he, was he carrying and et cetera? Now, like I said, that was really a long shot. I'm, 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 it'll be interesting to see how the big media, if you will, the big media, because <laughs> we're just a small operation here at MTN, how the big media 
will analyze, theorize, if you will, the purpose of putting this young man on the stand after bastardizing him in the way that they had done just a week and a half earlier. There's been no real reflection. You know, we've not seen the articulation, the, the, the crafting, you know, a popular word nowadays, the crafting of their observations with regards to why the prosecution. But see, we go all the way back to when Mike Freeman escalated the charge, enhanced it, as we like to say, as they like to say, to murder two you understand that why the attorneys for Mohammed Noor did not put up more resistance, if you will, and why they, particularly in light of the fact that it was doing depositions of this young man a year ago, that it was, to their credit, Nord's attorneys who broke him in, the, in regards to the changing of his story as opposed to what he had said in Room 108 on the late hours of the 15th of July and the early morning of, of uh, the 16th of July. What was it that he was saying in that room? What information, what so-called evidence? Now, we go back to the statements again, not, not made here at MTN, not, not made by us. You know, we are merely reporting the news with integrity and fairness. That the statement was made that all of a sudden he was not dependable, if you will. And then later, you know, almost two years later, the attorneys for Mohammed Nord, as, as, as we, and we have plenty of time, we have 16, 17 minutes. The attorneys, you know, forced the, the young man, I feel bad for him as it pertains to what the future holds for him, but he can always, you know, relocate, move to Montana, Idaho, Utah, somewhere, somewhere like that. But so little discussion about that because it has so much to do with the concern in communities of color and within those communities and those bases, if you will, that still feel that Mohammed Nord will be acquitted, if you will. I mean, what was that really all about? Now, the word subliminal comes into play. There are subliminal references and inferences that are made as a part of the psychological mind game. Maybe by planting, quote unquote, those thoughts in the minds of the jurors, whatever jurors that the prosecution had been observing for the last three weeks going into the fourth week that they thought that maybe they were beginning to lose. I assume that the prosecution has brought in a psychoanalyst, if you will, paying someone 25, 30,000 of your tax dollars to come in and to help the prosecution. I'm not talking about the, the defense. I'm talking about the prosecution to help them analyze, you know, the psychological mindset of these jurors, of, of, of these 16 individuals, 12 of whom will vote and make a determination one way or the other. And so you see all this being played out. And so I have to say to you, my friends, this afternoon from the studios of MTN, that the Australian media has peaked the whole card. And we have followed their concerns and anger. And they're angry, like we said earlier. They are really ticked because they had been told starting that night of the 15th of July, 2017, they had been told by individuals who had not been authorized. And we take you back to how the Star Tribune and others reported those so-called telephone calls. And, and a fiance that at one time was supposedly in New York and he winds up in Las Vegas. I mean, I don't know where he was when the police called him. Uh, that portion in the paper where he was giving testimony that he could not remember because he could not hear well because there was interference on, on the cell phone and, and et cetera. Apparently all the cell towers between wherever he was, Las Vegas or New York, uh, seemed to have technical difficulties as he was talking to a police officer, Minneapolis police officer, as he identified, who never identified for him that his fiance 
had been shot by a Minneapolis police officer. Now, we take you back to the archives of we here at MTN, where we provided a very concrete narrative about some of the discussion that was going on that night, and even the discussions that dealt with the unauthorized telephone calls. It wasn't, it wasn't Lieutenant Zimmerman. Lieutenant Zimmerman didn't make the call <laughs> and tell the fiance that a black, if you know, SOB had shot and killed his beautiful fiance. The archives, in the archives here at MTN, there are at least three programs in which we attempted to assist those who really were interested in what the heck had happened out there on the evening of 15 July 2017. And so we, we watch these events in the last week and a half and that, that's why we can understand, we can understand, we can appreciate as an observer at trial, at court, if you will, that people are now saying, wow, it doesn't look like they're gonna be able to, to convict this guy. You know, what the heck went wrong? Now the Star Tribune is already with its experts, if you will, along with the Australian media and other. See, they're already, they've already brought in their writers and et cetera that, that they use and analyze, to analyze, if you will, uh, what the heck went wrong. Now, if they get a conviction, of course, uh, Mike Freeman will pat himself on the back. Uh, the prosecutors will be called the, the, the greatest uh, individuals since the beginning of time and et cetera. But there is this eerie feeling uh, as we are, are in the, 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 the last uh, 12 minutes, 11 minutes of today's program, people are feeling those that are, that were just, you know, foaming at the mouth to rip Mohammed Nord apart, if you will. You know, it was on these programs here at MTN that we talked in terms of the one remaining, yes, 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 they never called, by the way, Somali sergeant at the 5th Precinct and how he had been threatened, disrespected, uh, you know, blasted, if you will, with uh, comments. Uh, he would come in, his locker, you know, had things written on it, the, the, the whiteboard, if you will, uh, in the uh, training room and et cetera, uh, calling him and his people all kinds of names. And, and it's amazing that, in, in fact, the, the inspector at the precinct at that time has now just become a deputy chief. <laughs> Part of the demand for a greater racial slash gender presence in the command of Madara Arredondo, the African-American chief of the department. Yes, yeah, see, folks maintain, we, we're not supposed to talk about that either, you know, but hey, we're here to provide news, if you will, factual information and, and et cetera. People will probably ask, because I doubt very much if any Somali, and there's only six of them remaining, police officers will be called by the defense to speak to the character of Mohammed Nord and et cetera. In fact, there was a slip by the attorneys last week, early last week, there was a slip up when they, in doing a, a cross-examination of a Minneapolis police officer, kind of opened the door with regards to the right of the prosecution to examine the psychological, psychological demeanor, activities and actions of Mohammed Nord. The judge at least was fair enough that she said the door had been partially opened. Now that, of course, meant that it hadn't been totally open, if you will, because things like that uh, are the kind of things that are a part of on, on appeal. <laughs> it's the kind of mistake that can cause a reversal, irrespective of what the decision is one way or the other. But it was interesting that she warned, and I assume all of you out there and, and all the other giants of, of, of social media and et cetera caught that, that she said to the, to the defense team, you partially went over the line and you partially opened the door 
but I will make a decision. Now, obviously, a decision was made, but we've not had the kind of news coverage that we, quote unquote, the citizens deserve. How did she rule, or did she indicate that she would hold in abeyance her ruling until after the conclusion of the trial, or she will use that situation when she charges the jury, if you will. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not in the courtroom, I'm not in the courtroom, but I, I know enough about law, and I know enough about the thinking of legal practitioners to know that there have been some half steps by the prosecution, and maybe a couple by the defense, if, if you will. And so, we watch closely here at MTN how this will conclude, if you will. It will have to conclude because we maintain, we join with our reporter on the ground at MTN, from MTN in the courtroom, that there's really not much left. You've called as many police and, and experts and et cetera, the BCA, <laughs> which really is a disaster, uh, coming in, giving an analysis and et cetera. Yesterday, they, they fought over the issue of, you know, was there clear uh, fingerprints, you know, handprints and et cetera. It amazed me that no one initially thought, you know, did she hit the car with an open palm like this, which would have left some fingerprints, or did she hit it with her fist, which would have left none? You know, did she hit it with her elbow? I don't know, we, 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 we don't know. We, we, we certainly don't know. But it's the job of the prosecution and the defense, the defense and the, pro pro the prosecution, uh, to bring these things into play so that the jury will have an opportunity to balance it all out, if you will. It'll be interesting in the courtroom when the judge, unless there's a mistrial between <laughs> now <laughs> and the defense closing, if you will, resting, as they, as they say, it'll be interesting to see how the judge charges the jury. At that sake, again, an Anglo-Saxon Norman, actually, the Norman... Nor, under Norman law, you also do this. That's, Norman law is basically practiced by the French, the Belgians, the Netherlands, the Germans, you know, most of the folks in, in, in our, uh, you know, Europe, if you will. It'll be interesting. That's what you want to keep your eye on, how the judge will charge the jury, what she will say to them with regards to the expectations of law. That's important. What are the expectations of law with regards to what the jury will be asked to place value and weight on and in the interest of, if you will. And so as we move into to the last three minutes, if you will, we thought it was extremely important because we feel that next week sitting in these studios here at MTN, a little small a media group, if you will, in the big powerful city of Minneapolis with all this liberalism, <laughs> that we will probably be saying to you that the um, prosecution has rested and the defense is about to put on its case in chief, if you will. I, I just assume it will be there. I just don't see how we can have any more um, witnesses or time for witnesses and, and et cetera. There are just not enough witnesses as it pertains to how many people were in that alley. You know, I mean, the fact of the matter is it's basically conclusively been shown there was, you know, as far as human beings, there were four people in the alley. One became deceased, two police officers, and a, at that time, 16-year-old bicyclist, if you will, who was going to be the person that in the tradition of you know television and the movies was going to blow the case wide open. It'll be interesting to see in closing how the experts, those that really know what's going on, <laughs> will analyze for those of us who are quote unquote the retarded, if you will, on what happened, be it an acquittal or be it the finding of guilt. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to come into your lives and into your computer and onto your screen, if you will. These have been interesting times. And by the way, there are additional stories out there, but we'll be sharing it with you over the coming weeks. And by the way, 
we have not forgotten, and in the next month, we will begin to take a look at the trial of Terrence Franklin, which begins on October the 7th, 2019. That's going to be very interesting. On behalf of our very fine production staff, let us never be referred to as that racist group of people that because we did not analyze, pay attention, and look at all of the information that we're referred to as that racist group of people that become extinct <laughs> because the train ran over us and we didn't know what was coming. God bless you, particularly black Minnesota. I'm Ron Edwards. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening.